computer. Thank you so much. So uh, sorry, uh, we had some issues uh, with the YouTube live streaming. So now we are recording the session and we will see that uh, where we can put it up uh, in the public domain with the discussion with the panelists. So I guess we were discussing about diversity and diversity has a very, very wide application. Now saying this, uh, I think uh, we can think as somebody mentioned, uh, one of the panelists mentioned that we can have uh, so gender diversity is one aspect. There is diversity in terms of linguistic differences. Uh, one of the panelists put through there are uh, diversity in the context of which institutions we come from, which regions of the country we come from, what are our cultural and uh, social backgrounds. So on that note, uh, I would uh, ask uh, Mopi, I think you mentioned that uh, you did your graduate studies at Pennsylvania State University. Is that correct, Mopia? Yeah. So do you mind uh, telling us uh, a little bit about if you find any differences, similarities in the, uh, in the environment? Uh, because that was a different country. So since we are talking about diversity. So you, you, you did your graduate studies in the US. And do you see that there are differences, similarities, strength, weakness that you feel when you have moved to move back to India? Is there some experiences you want to share with us? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so what I, I would like to share is that when I moved to, so I did my master, till my master's I was here, uh, so till 2012. And then when I moved, um, diversity wise, so Penn State had a uh, astronomy department, which is separate from the physics department. But there were, at that time, I was like the only Indian student there. And everyone else was uh, from US. So the diversity in that aspect, the international aspect, especially say, to be very frank, like the brown people were very less in number. So like, and my accent, my English is very, very different from my classmates. So it took me a few months to adjust. And um, so one experience I had was that I was a TA when I went there and the very first uh, day I had to teach a class. And then the students there, they were not able to fully understand what I'm saying and they're not used to spending effort into decoding like a people like me, my accent is very different from American accent at that point. Uh, so there was this disconnect and I also got this feedback from the students that it's hard to understand and this was like an additional challenge at that point of time for me so uh, but I mean later on it became uh, much easier but I, I so I, I would like to speak on the linguistics barrier front and then when I moved to uh, Switzerland uh, I was in the French speaking country and uh, I again faced this language issue that when we would have like many colleagues, uh, it's very easy and natural for all the colleagues. If like 10 of them are speaking in the same language, they would speak in that language only. But like there would be one or two people who don't speak that language and they feel left out. And this has happened to me. And so when I come back to India, so it's much easier for me here because I do speak Hindi and English. Uh, so right now I'm in Maharashtra, uh, but it's, sometimes I do see this that maybe it should be is shared widely that if you are in a group, try to include everyone linguistically, because it's very easy uh, say what even I did that when I was younger and I did not have this consciousness in the back of my mind, that there were a lot of Bengali people in my class. So often we would speak in Bengali when there was like one or two people who don't speak Bengali, but it was somehow never, it, it came to me when I was in MSc or BSc that uh, it's not good for them and they are feeling excluded. And this, some, sometimes it happens to me here also. I mean, people may be talking in Marathi or Malayalam or Tamil or whatever language, but since it's a very, very multilingual country and it's quite easy to stop and switch to a common language if we really put an emphasis into the training or we have a discussion about it at the beginning of uh, when the grad students come. 
Yeah. Yeah. So was, that's my experience. So that's great, Mopia. So you actually you actually told us about uh, the cultural uh, barrier that you faced, particularly in terms of linguistics, and you know, and as you as I can completely share. Uh, this feeling with you because it's the same for all us. And talking about Bengali, I have to apologize that after I saw the panel, I saw that a large fraction of the panelists, uh, in, including the senior people and the junior people, as a large fraction are actually Bengalis, although the institutions are sort of spread out uh, over all, almost, I've tried thinking that to spread, spread them out all over India, but the representation has been uh, not say uniform in terms of you know regional representation. So we have to be very careful whenever we are in a decision making position that we take all these concerns uh, very carefully, as Mopia suggested that uh, nobody should feel excluded. So on this note, uh, I would like to uh, now invite uh, uh, Harvinder uh, because uh, she has been uh, like me. Uh, in a teaching institution, teaching come research institution. So Harvinder, uh, I think uh, one of the, so one of the issues uh, uh, we often discuss in academia is about this, you know, academic caste system and sometimes maybe, uh, you know, in our, so as Mopia said that she was staying uh, for the course as a graduate student, she was staying and then, you know, TAs give this feedback. But generally, uh, those experiences, uh, people in India who go to uh, mostly research institutes for their PhDs uh, do not uh, sort of do not get a wide experience on teaching or mentoring younger students. I mean, unlike people who, are, who do, for example, their PhDs in probably IITs, uh, I know that people have to compulsorily do TAs, but I don't know what's the situation with ISAR. Uh, Aizar. So Harvinder, can you just comment on this issue? Like, uh, how do you, what do you think is the importance, for example, of teaching and, you know, actually, uh, you know, uh, making this, uh, uh, you know, union between teaching and research and does it help and what should we think about it and how should we approach it? So I would be very happy uh, to share your vision, please. Yeah. For continuity, I would take up Mapio's Mopia's point about diversity. We have a very diverse set of students. Mm -hmm. We come from all over India. And it's quite, actually, Aizar Mohali is indeed quite diverse. So much so that we have uh, festivals, which has a significant number of different regions of India. Having said that, in teaching, uh, uh, one has to make sure that everyone understands you. So if you're, so medium of instruction is English. But you have to make sure that you... Uh, speak in a certain way or not use which are regional linguistic uh, leads to the language and try to make a point and make your points in a uh, sort of sometimes you have to use bad English in fact you may be more fluent in English than you speak in a class but that's a choice you make and to make it more accessible to students and coming to uh, your point about whether uh, PhD students are involved in teaching yes yeah. They are not supposed, they are, uh, we ask them to interact with students in labs. And there they do what is called the day grading and they interact with students. And for the day, grade of the day they give, although it's the duty of the main instructor, whether they want to, uh, how much work they want to put, it, put the PhD students. In. It's not that your PhD student will work with you in the lab. It's, yeah. it's, it's a mix, everything, everyone. So they are given to, uh, TA duties in that sense. Postdoctoral fellows are uh, uh, are uh, asked to teach once in a while, so they are mostly given duties so that their load is not very high. And Dipan Vita has also uh, taught in some sense the grade, basically help out in grading and uh, tutors, of course. So this is what we do. And your point about uh, your research institutions, whether they get uh, uh, teaching opportunities or not, it depends on the rules of the institute. Mm -hmm. And one can always volunteer for it. For instance, I have volunteered for teaching while I was a postdoc mm -hmm. also. So I just go and say, to learn this uh, course, I would go and say, can I tutor for you? And I have tutored for many people, many of them who have been my mentors. So I think I will stop at that and take oh, So, So Harvinder, would you suggest, uh, we have uh, like graduate students in the panel also, so would you suggest uh, our young colleagues to sort of uh, voluntarily take this initiative uh, to go and teach undergraduate classes or master's classes, which 
Uh, would you would you would you would you make that suggestion Pers- as you have done yeah. yourselves? Personally, I I did that because I always like to interact with more people. I was always very interactive in that sense with younger people or generally people my age. Uh, it's it's your choice. But personally, I feel that if you want to learn a subject very very well, it's better to teach it so that you basically learn the basics very very well for that. If you want to teach it, because you want to express it in a way which is understandable by a person. who may or may not speak your language or who may not or at your level of understanding in that subject so it it makes you better so that's what i would say that's my first yeah thank you so much arvind so now i'll just uh, uh, get the microphone to nisim uh, since nisim has been in like national center for radio astrophysics nisim what is the policy at ncra and uh, how would you see this uh, uh, you know uh, this teaching uh, research uh, the dichotomy or you know trying to eradicate the dichotomy what's your thought on that uh, if you if you if you can share some words uh, so okay so there is a there's a historical dichotomy in india which goes back to baba i guess where uh, a, a kind of a conscious decision was made to put money into uh, into uh, to 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 put a lot of money into a, s- a small set of institutions and uh, probably not i mean to 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 focus on a set of institutions the belief was that there was not enough money to distribute it widely and if you did you'd wind up with uh, with a, with a with a low average all over and this is this discussion has uh, has gone on probably for 70 80 years now it's clear that it has had problems in the sense that there is been a separation of research hmm, i'm not sure what happened yeah there's been a separation between research and uh, undergraduate uh, uh, education Uh, and that's probably the 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 place where it's hurt us uh, the most in the sense that people start getting exposed to research only at a uh, typically at a latish uh, stage of their uh, of their academic learning career so, the, so there's a transition that happens in research i think when you go from learning to doing when you go from um, you know taking stuff from a textbook as being right and asking questions about what you're reading and the transition is not an easy one we see that uh, quite a bit amongst uh, students and the earlier you do it the better it is of course so if you spend a lot of your time up to say msc or the msc or the phd level uh, um believing in things or believing that what you're being told is correct it's hard to make that transition so i think in a formal sense the uh, the separation between under, between teaching and research and research such as we have in india is an unhealthy one it's uh, the, it is important to have this uh, an, an overlap and i completely agree with harvinder's point that uh, that uh, if if you if you really understand a subject in order to understand a subject it's more to teach it the the alternative point of view and so so i have the general belief that it's very hard to come up with a one size fits all solution in 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 things like academia personal style is important personal approaches are important i think that having this point is a is a very valid one uh, it's also true that there are individuals who are good at research and bad at teaching and are bad at communicating what they do and that's just a spectrum of people across the board in research the people who are competent at uh, who are better at teaching at communicating i, I know some people so some of my best teachers for example at the, at uh, at pune university I, i won't name them but some of of uh, you know my favorite teachers were not very good researchers they loved learning and there is a conscious dis- a distinction between learning and communicating the learning and carrying out original research so so there is uh, it's not immediately apparent that the that a single individual uh, necessarily has to be an outstanding teacher and an outstanding researcher and my view is that these are two uh, uh, overlapping if you like or complementary if you like attributes i think it's important to do both and to to try both out and to give us the opportunity of finding out whether you like them whether you like you know them both or whether you like one more than the other and so on i i do feel that the thing that we have in institutions where we have almost a separation and this uh disregard if you like for undergraduate teaching i think it's an unhealthy one so sorry i went on for too long no no that's fine thank you thank you so much so do you think that uh, would you would you sort of for example advise your students let's say at ncra or other research institutes to take up uh, you know voluntarily like teaching uh, assignments uh, as for example we heard harvin that did when 
when she was uh, a postdoc, uh, if I remember correctly. So what would what would you, would you would you advise students to do that or? I have a policy of not advising people unless they ask for advice. Uh, okay. Unless I'm formally teaching a, a thing. Uh, if somebody were to ask me if he or she should uh, uh, should should teach, I would ask him or her why, uh, as I would do with pretty much any question that were asked to me. Uh, so, for example, if the person says I'm interested in teaching, or, or that I'd like the experience, I'd say by all means, I try to find a path, you know, so that the person could teach. But because you know, teaching undergraduates is not a triviality. Uh, there are university rules that you have to you have to work out. Uh, I mean, for example, grading may not be allowed uh, if you don't have a PhD. Yes. So, exactly. so, the, so you have to find a path. If if the purpose is to and, and so uh, I, I would I would ask the question of you know. Uh, why do you want to do this? And there is a balance, as I said, because the balance is that prepare. Suppose you're teaching a full course, for example, right? One that may not be possible because the rules may forbid it. The second thing is that the load taking on a full course, if you're a PhD student, the first time you do it is very high. So is that a good idea for you, for, for you to get into? And that's a choice that you make. So I would lay out the what I feel are the pros and cons. Uh, you know, my PhD supervisor, Kandu, was very good at uh, always providing this, you know, these are the pros, these are the cons, and you decide to do whatever you want to do at this. And I, I don't do it as well as he does remotely, but I, I like the idea of saying that, there are, that of, you know, presenting these pros and cons. Now, if the person feels that he or she would like to do this, I, I would normally suggest doing a TA ship to start with. So teaching a few lectures, teaching a part of a course with somebody, and, and then taking it from there. Okay. So uh, thank you, thank you so much, Nisim. So, uh, so talking about since we are talking about uh, institutions and institutional diversity, I would now invite uh, Shushmita, who is here uh, with us uh, from Presidency University, so to share because she is in a university environment and uh, a place uh, which has, uh, in the last ten years, just transited from an undergraduate college to a full uh, university. So Shushmita, would you like to share some of your experiences here, the uh, good things that you thought were useful and uh, any challenges you have faced or anything you want to uh, bring out uh, about your academic experiences so far? Because you have been at presidency and uh, you know I know that it's kind of challenging there because the resources are definitely uh, sometimes not comparable to many of your many of the other peers who can get so Shushmita, do you want to tell something? Hello, could you hear me? Yeah, Ms. Shushmita, is it okay? Uh, we can't hear you again. Uh, is it okay? Hello. I can't hear actually. Can others hear you, Shushmita? You can like switch off your video if you want. Hello, hello. Is it now? It's okay? It's very low. It's very low. Sushmita, if, if I can yeah, interrupt, you can uh, try joining via your phone, I think, instead of the laptop. It might help. Okay. I think there is an audio issue with her. OK, OK. Uh, then, uh, then I think uh, maybe uh, let's talk about, uh, since uh, we are discussing, we, we, we discussed uh, diversity in, in some sense, but as I said, that it has a lot of aspects to it. So one thing that I really found um, that probably requires formal training in academia is, uh, I think some of the panelists said that, how can we be inclusive? I think Vasundhara mentioned that, uh, how can we be probably Vasundhara mentioned that, how can we be inclusive uh, in, in the old spectrum? So telling this, I would ask uh, Prajwal because, you know, even in uh, casual conversation, uh, it's likely, sometimes likely that in a group, we are making a casual conversation, maybe in a conference, maybe not even in a conference, maybe in the tea table or wherever, where it's possible that uh, we say things uh, which can actually uh, be quite exclusive and, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't go well with the academic, I would say academic environment of the place or anything. So would you like to comment that what should we uh, 
probably advice, not just our younger colleagues, but generally what should be uh, sort of the norms or understanding in the community that what uh, we can say in a conversation, how to be, so maybe I'll put it this way that how to be uh, inclusive in our interactions with our, uh, with our, with our colleagues in the professional uh, community. So do you wanna share some of your views? <laughs> Um, so, firstly, I uh, think that uh, overall and by and large, if we look at institutions and practitioners across the country, uh, there isn't an acknowledgement that there is a problem mm -hmm. uh, of this, of lack of inclusion and of how our everyday uh, behavior in the workspace uh, perpetuates that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, a problem, uh, but that is not, that is a problem that the senior uh, academics need to address. Um, so I, I personally don't think there is any way around educating ourselves uh, about this uh, because we are all uh, brought up in a society which is inequitable, which has diversity but stratification. And we are all brought up to accept that sort of stratification, both in uh, action uh, and in climate. So uh, I don't think there's a way around education. So uh, I uh, did not mention uh, some efforts towards this by uh, for example, there's a complementary group called the Gender Equity uh, in Physics Group under the Indian Physics Association, um, which came out with something called the Hyderabad Charter for Gender Equity, and which was endorsed by the, both the WGGE as well as other working groups, such as the Indian Association for General Relativity and Gravitation. So that uh, one of the recommendations there is to have social science uh, included in the PhD curriculum so that we learn uh, at an early age about social processes in larger society, which can leak into our professional workspace, despite the best intentions. And uh, the other thing, of course, is to have general sensitization, education, and the teaching of uh, how we behave with mutual respect, and how we nurture a collaborative environment rather than a toxic environment. And that sort of education we recommend should be uh, done at all levels, right? From uh, the student level up to the leadership level. So uh, I, I don't, I mean, this, these are things which are recommendations in that charter and that came out of a lot of thought by multiple people in multiple forums. So I don't think I can individually improve upon it, uh, but we don't have enough of it uh, yet. We don't even have enough to, uh, let us say, um, evaluate it and see what the impacts have been. So we do need to try it out, I believe. So uh, yeah, I would say, and in the absence of formal structures and formal mechanisms um, that institutions ought to introduce, Perhaps young people can take the initiative uh, and push for these things themselves. Although I, I really hesitate to uh, say things like that because I think the onus is on uh, senior academics with permanent responsible positions in institutions. Yes, thank you so much Prajwal. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. We have to hear uh, our, our students and young postdocs. Uh, we have to take feedback from them, but the onus is definitely on the senior people to make all these practices part of our regular, you know. Uh, so I, so on this note, since Prajwal mentioned about social science, I think the professional development kind of course or sensitization, not really course, but you know, some kind of workshop or that, that becomes mandatory right from the PhD stage or when you become a faculty, it is mandatory because I know that uh, in the US, for example, when I was there, it was mandatory for faculty to take like several, you know, management courses, uh, sensitization workshops, workshops, etc. I have heard that that is also becoming uh, mainstream in India. I don't know how much it's successful yet. But on that point, I would want to ask uh, one of our panelists, uh, Balpreet, uh, and then maybe Basundara, you can, if you want to share that, have you ever felt that 
uh, it would be useful for you to go through uh, you know such kind of training processes or for example the other important aspect that i always feel is that you know when we go to a conference we have this you know big shot scientists and we want to share ideas and it's very difficult for us to talk some of us are intimidated that you know i can't speak uh, good english or maybe i am not smart enough to go and you know share my ideas with but so all of these act as inhibitions uh, toward professional growth so i at that note i would like to ask uh, uh, so Dipanita, sorry, uh, Vasundhara or Dipanita, since you are uh, you are a little bit a senior in the field, you have finished your PhD. Would you like to tell us that have you ever felt the need uh, for being part of such uh, a training program or something? Dipanita, would you uh, want to share anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, if that kind of workshops are arranged, that is uh, very good, I would say. But till now, if it is not, I mean, we didn't do this kind of thing. Anymore. But when I was in PhD, I remember one of our senior, he was there. Whatever they learned, he shared with me first time when we went there. That's there. There were very um, good number of Bengali students over there as far as that. Then he told us on the first day itself that whenever you go to eat or something in the canteen, and when you are sitting together, never speak it in native language. That's the first thing he told and try to involve everyone present there so that you can talk to everyone like that. So that's how he told me on the, uh, on the first day. So that's what we tried to maintain. And when our juniors also came, we also told them the same thing. That when you want to talk, just involve everyone and talk like that. So that is the thing when I went to my first postdoc was in Hazan Mohali. They are also we used to talk together. Like we never used any kind of net language over there. So I'm trying to do that till now. But if that kind of workshops are arranged, I will say that um, it will help, of course, to uh, include everyone together. And about that self-confidence thing, that will also be uh, helpful because sometimes we feel that, uh, yeah, that we want to talk to people. That we, Initial days, we feel that we are not uh, eligible enough to talk to them and maybe they won't listen to it. It's the thing. But actually, it is not. We should be uh, confident enough to talk to because people are there to help. Because initially we hesitate, that's true. But uh, even if we go to and talk to them, that actually helps because they are always ready to help. So we should uh, get over this thing. Uh, and if the workshop kind of things are arranged, that will of course help um, help in this situation. I think. So, wonderful. So, uh, Sundara, do you want to uh, share some of your views about it? Yeah. So I am uh, definitely in favor of workshop and courses that uh, impart this kind of knowledge, but I also believe that putting something like this as mandatory might, you know, uh, not be very favorable for people who might take it as a burden rather than a learning experience, because that always happens when you have a tight schedule to work with. But also, uh, I think these kind of workshops, if done at all, like sometimes, uh, I think all major institutes sometimes have, you know, like stress management or mental health workshops, these kind of things. So it should be more of a practical experience than, you know, slide sharing and uh, uh, kind of uh, imparting it theoretically. Because what I believe uh, with whatever experience I have it in academia so far, networking is very imp is important part of our job. Because as you said, we should be able to speak to people in conferences. This is also something I have faced in the beginning of my PhD and even now sometimes. But what I often... Uh, tell my juniors is that it's good to go to conferences on your own, even if you don't have somebody to accompany you from the institute. Because when you are like going with a friend, you tend to uh, always hang out in a group and then you don't really expose yourself to other people so much. So sometimes if you go somewhere alone, since you don't know anybody already there, you can meet new people and, and it always doesn't have to be a conversation about work. Uh, you can simply form a friendship by getting to know each other and then slowly the work thing follows in if you think that you are not very equipped to talk about work right now. So that could be done. And of course, one thing I have understood by staying abroad, which uh, Mopi also mentioned about this linguistic thing or cultural thing. So because I was also in uh, Switzerland, uh, it's very similar to India in terms of cultural diversity in Europe, because you have people from all different countries. Uh, if you're sitting together, what I feel is lacking a lot in India is interest in each other's cultures. Like if I'm sitting with somebody from say Kerala or Tamil Nadu, I, 
i want to feel this interest in me that i will ask about their food or their culture their festivals this these things should kind of come in in general conversations i think and then it makes your uh, you know your workspace more inclusive in a way because instead of trying to distinguish uh, you can uh, think of it as a unifying force that there are certain similarities between other our cultures too or if our languages have evolved from the same original language then because i have seen people in europe like french italian spanish people they'll connect and see oh what is the original latin word for just to cite an example so the, these things uh, actually i like very much from what i've seen in europe i i wish that would happen more often in india because we do share the same origin in many different ways so yeah that if there is a workshop or something i would like someone to talk about this also oh that's that's great thank you thank you vasundara yeah. so maybe uh, balpreet and then avik can you quickly tell us that have you ever felt the need for some not just understanding you know linguistic barrier or as some of your colleagues said but generally have you ever felt that other than direct academic uh, support have you ever felt the need for you know uh, profession formal formal support on other professional aspects Uh, of the scientific community. So, Balpreet, do you want to share anything uh, specific uh, to the panel? Um, yeah. Before that, I would uh, like to comment or add something about the uh, discussion about inclusivity. So, I feel that like uh, talking about exclusivity would be more helpful if it is targeted in some ways, like. uh the approach to become more exclusive in a setup would be different depending on what we are uh what we want to achieve like for example if we want to become more inclusive in terms of uh the caste distribution or gender distribution then the kind of things we would do would be different than just uh be more open while talking to each other because uh like for example for caste representation if there is not enough representation in an institute then just making ourselves more aware won't be very helpful because there needs to be more representation of the people who can talk about what problems they are facing so i think like in general saying that we can make like for example uh in such cases i think statistics or doing the numbers would be very helpful which some people in uh, which uh, people have been doing in astronomy uh what are the numbers and so on so like for example if uh there are statistics that show for uh that the number of uh women uh doing postdocs decline uh compared to phd then the approach to uh, handle that problem would be different uh, than just saying that there should be more workshops or things like that and uh and talking about um, could you uh, sujitha so could you repeat the question you had asked uh, so the question so the so, so i think the question is that have you ever felt any need for a uh, sort of like professional a uh, development course where you are being explicitly taught that how to let's say manage stress or how to be inclusive in your communications or how to be you know how to uh, let's say uh, go in a conference and you know talk to people how to improve your communication have you ever felt any need that a formal training uh, a formal discussion formal course type or workshop type of dis discussion would be helpful or is it just that you pick it up from your colleagues as you go along the way that's my question did that make sense uh, balpreet oh, yeah yeah uh, i think it would uh, in general be helpful uh, to have such a discussion like uh, a more um uh, like one of the problems is uh we uh, at young stages uh, people uh, women especially faces the uh self confidence and uh, critical evaluation of one's own um uh, abilities and so on so if like uh 
like if it is generally that we use a more uh, balanced metric than just comparing ourselves to other people mm -hmm. uh, that is helpful and that happens often uh, by just chatting with uh, more and more people but I think it would generally be helpful if there is a formal workshop talking about some of the issues or some kind of mentoring session where uh, young people or uh, the people at MSc or BSc or PhD stages can uh, work out how to evaluate oneself, but not in an over-critical way, but in a balanced way and okay. what would be useful. And That's great. That's great, Balpit. So maybe Avik, um, do you want to share uh, your views about it? And then uh, we will go to uh, Sudeshna. So if you have any okay, suggestions. So the the need for this type of conference is uh, very much uh, helpful to um, uh, for the students so i can share my experience uh, uh, regarding this so uh, so one problem <coughs> the main problem i faced in my phd that to choose a suitable projects for me project and okay so because i had no experience uh, a PhD work or project during my MSc days, and this sudden jump into the research ADR field made me little confused. Though I have overcome this by little and little effort, so the, my main work is on data analysis and uh, modeling part. So persistence is very much uh, needed for this work, this type of work. So my take home message from this experience is. You should do some uh, internship before PhD to get some idea about that research field. And the persistence is very much needed. And do some uh, also do some collaborations in uh, PhD. And it will be a nice journey. And the main thing is competition. So don't compete with others. Uh, we should not do that. And because collaboration is any day better than the competition. Okay. So, Thank you so you. much, Avik. Sudeshna, do you want to put forward some quickly something that in this regard? Yeah, so I would like to add another point on this. Uh, so it, yeah, I am in favor of uh, like arranging workshop. Uh, so including time management, like uh, how to like once we in uh, join PhD, we don't have the view for five years. And especially for us, uh, like from Iser Tirupati, which is relatively new, and we are the first batches from the institute. We don't have any seniors to look up. So, like, yeah, so this timeline is a struggle for us. So, in the beginning of the PhD, if we have like idea, okay, we have five years' time when you have to complete this. So, that will be uh, good, I think. Yeah. Wonderful. And all, yeah, and also another thing is, yeah, maybe this is. I don't know, maybe the uh, writing skills, some, uh, I, I think some uh, workshops are there uh, regarding that, but more on writing skill, like uh, writing competitive proposals uh, for uh, like facilities, like international and national facilities, how to uh, use, suppose an ALMA, JWST. So some Indian, uh, we already submitted proposals in JWST, but putting that in the, uh, bigger like who already submitted so they have some idea how to do that so making some common uh, group and discuss all those so that uh, we can propagate it to others we can use more of those facilities yeah that uh, like my point adding this thank you so much so we, we so we heard uh, some very interesting points that our uh, young colleagues have raised now i would now go to uh, yeah so Rival, you want to say something you want to add something please <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to uh, respond to very quickly to some of the points which came up. Um, so one thing was, uh, one major point is that when we are talking about these workshops and all that, we are talking about them as a sort of whole suite of things outside of our of the regular PhD curriculum. But I think that confuses the issue because, uh, you know, uh, professional development 
has come up, writing skills have come up, counseling has come up. Whereas when I talked about uh, having workshops and education, I was specifically talking about equality education, not about self-improvement kind of things. I mean, writing skills, time management, etc. You know, the writing skills are now part of the PhD curriculum in many, many places, and they should be the part a part of it that's kind of a no-brainer uh, uh, actually uh, but I was talking about something different something uh, that aims at improving the climate not in improving individuals not in making us uh, better at our work but improving the climate our institutional climate so I think we should not confuse uh, the two kinds of things and you know professional management is one suite which was not something I was talking about at all I was talking about equality education uh, second point was about it being mandatory and how that is uh, that could be seen as a burden etc the point is it should become mainstreamed to the uh, extent that uh, skill or ability or capacity to behave in a respect sorry, respectful manner uh, in order to make the climate inclusive should be part of our qualification. So for example, we don't allow somebody who doesn't have a master's to do a PhD. So it should be like that. So it cannot be seen as a burden. It's not something extra. It is part, it's just like, you know, we do a medical test when we enter a PhD program because that is thought of as necessary. We don't think of it as a burden. It's like, just, just part of the normal course of things, right? And secondly, unless it is made, unless it is mainstreamed, it will never be valued. It will always be seen as this fluffy, sidey kind of thing, which is not important. Um, thirdly, I wanted to respond to Balpreet's point. I think it's a very, very important point that she raised that when you do not have diversity, what sense does it make to learn about it uh, theoretically? Uh, my response to that would be that we do need to address both. So one does need to address the lack of diversity in the distribution. Um, however, one also, I think, needs to have this equality education in order to educate people who are there about their privilege. Because unless that happens, uh, when the uh, student body or the faculty body becomes more diverse, the privileged people don't know how to behave. So unless they learn about their privilege, they will land up perpetuating uh, whatever it is, sexism, casteism, uh, hegemony of English, uh, all of these things. So that's what. Thank you so much, Prajwal, for uh, pointing this. I completely agree with what uh, Prajwal said. And uh, I was going to bring that to the point that yeah, it should not be taken as a burden at all. I, I, I hope that when people are saying that it comes as a burden, they fully are not probably understanding that uh, on, on what context we are talking about it, because all of us had to go through such kind of, you know, professional, because when I started TAing, I had to go through courses that how am I supposed to behave in a class. Now, now the two important points I think came up, one is about representation. The other is, uh, we always have this argument, you know, about, oh, you know, sometimes excellence cannot be compromised. I mean, there is this global war, there is this war that I see in the professional community that I always hear something, oh, you know, we can't do that because that's going to compromise our excellence. Uh, yeah, it's fine to be diverse, but that doesn't mean. So on this note, because this is a hard debate, I don't, I don't because I have heard that all over coming again and again. So on that note, I would want to ask uh, uh, Nisim, uh, what is your take on that? Like, do you really think that diversity and excellence has any conflict or, uh, for example, I believe that diversity actually enhances excellence, but I have seen people arguing in the opposite way uh, because no, we don't, we have to only care for. So Nisim, would you like to share your views on that? Yeah. Okay, so is, yeah. Let me be a bit direct over here. I think that this, that the question is almost meaningless in, in the sense that the, the, the reason I think it's meaningless is that I don't think most of these, these quantifications of excellence have any meaning. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you say diversity enhances excellence, I don't know what you mean until you define what, you know, what the word excellence means. So I have not seen, uh, uh, let, let, let me finish, but I think that the, 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 I think this is an important point. Yeah. And I think this, the, words like excellence are abused far too often. 
there is, uh, and, and, and I, I mean, I, I, the, the direction which you're going is one in which I agree with, but I think the, the, the you know, the, even this, even saying that we are aiming for excellence can, I think, is a dangerous thing mm -hmm. because that leads us to this fake meritocracy uh, uh, approach, I think. So I, I would not say that diversity implies excellence. I would say diversity is an extremely useful thing. And there have been studies that have shown that diversity actually enhances the quality of science or the quality of intellectual yeah. thought. Yeah, right. that's what I exactly meant. Like, yeah. Excellence actually have no meaning to me, quite honestly, in this, because I, I don't think that, that we have a way of quantifying this. Uh, th th then it's just, it's usually th this thing that, oh, you know, we have this wonderful community and we are excellent and we want to keep it this way. So, but, but I, I feel that it's important to make the point that there have been studies that have shown that if you bring in people for, with different views or different uh, approaches, the quality of the, of the work or the ability to come up with innovative ideas does improve. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, that, that is probably a reasonable metric in science. So therefore, I think that diversity by itself, it's, it's almost a triviality, right? That if you're not if 50, 70% of your population, like say in India, we have this highly you know, upper caste biased uh, academic system. We have uh, uh, certainly a lower than 50% got uh, a balance in academic institutions uh, based on gender. Mm -hmm. So we are not, I mean, more than 70, 75% of the community I is not part is. of our yeah. academic system. At which point uh, the, the issue is, uh, let alone diversity, you're just not, the, 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 the community is not contributing. It's not contributing, they're not being allowed to contribute. This is unhealthy full stop. So, so I think it's a no-brainer that diversity is uh, foundational. You need to get as many people involved as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. That's absolutely right. So I think the whole idea is that we cannot, talent is like distributed all over the society. So we really cannot exclude a large section of the community because we need talented and you know creative people to come and contribute um, to the community so as i think that's what you meant when you said that we are excluding so, so we are i think yeah. has something that she wanted to yeah Prajal, you want to make a comment please yeah i think the reason uh, that people are you know people say these statements that you were quoting suchetana i mean i i completely agree with this but the reason people quote your kind yeah the statements you quoted is because in India we somehow culturally as a society uh, we have begun to associate the word uh, diversity or reservations with the idea of dilution of merit mm. uh, but the truth is that the reservation policy and diversity policies are effectively an admission of failure of not having addressed both historic and contemporary oppression in our society. So because we weren't able to address that, we now have to do uh, involve you know, diversity and reservation policies. So the thing is, to, that is why a social science, a sociology course becomes critical in order to teach us that this is not about dilution of merit. It is about acknowledging historical and contemporary oppression, which then leads to discrimination. Discrimination within academia, within the criteria of merit, within all of that. And I mean, uh, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, as part of all this gender equity work, we have published papers which show that the meritocracy is flawed. That is exactly what Ms. Sim was also saying. What we are calling merit, that concept itself, the way we've defined it, the way we implement it within academia and within physics more than I would say other disciplines is flawed. So it's also this whole semantics thing. And uh, so coming into coming to grips with that does require um, a rigorous engagement with the issue. Yeah. That is why sociology course. Thank you so much, Prajwal. So I think uh, since we had some very interesting terms like uh, flawed meritocracy or um, you know uh, things like representation and all that. So on that note, I will uh, invite uh, Harvinder to share her views on this way we are operating. And we, we have seen, uh, I know if uh, the others have seen it or not, but Nisim, Nisim did work on particularly one very important aspect is how we uh, you know, how we take admission to, to our PhD programs. And that itself uh, showed that there is some bias, inherent bias into that process. But on that note, uh, Harvinder, uh, I would uh, invite you to share your views on 
this idea of meritocracy that we have and sort of the, and how that in some way uh, affecting uh, representation or diversity and what, what should be the way forward? So if you could share your views, uh, Harvinder. Okay, I agree with what Nisim and uh, Prajwal have just said that it gives you a meritocracy viewpoint. Uh, as I said, first of all, uh, there is a reservation policy by the government of India, if that is followed to the letter. So that is basically a trailblazing thing. Okay, in the sense that if some uh, affirmative action is given, so it makes paves the way for others to come in also. Okay, so that is very important in my view. I don't think I have much to add with already missing and Prajwal have already mentioned a lot about it. And another thing is to, uh, for instance, let's say, uh, because this is a WGG meeting, uh, all the, I would say, for instance, women and the networking that they miss out on because of various social and family issues, probably helping out and coming back to the workshop thing, pro probably that is the networking point for different diverse set of people. Okay, and that I would propose as one of the things to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Harvinder. So since uh, we have been uh, talking about representation and working in diverse groups, one of the very important things, particularly in astrophysics, it's very important. It's important in all of physics and all of science is that once we have people in a group from diverse socio-cultural backgrounds, you know, other kinds of, uh, you know, diverse aspects. So we have a big group, a LIGO collaboration or the CERN collaboration, the Let's See collaboration, even in astrophysics, when we work together as a scientist, as colleagues. So working in a group, for example, uh, requires all kinds of all of these skills to understand uh, other people's perspectives, other that, as Prajwal pointed out, that I might be privileged in this aspect, but that certain other person might not have, you know, um, gone through that privileged experience. So on that point, uh, I would uh, like to ask you, maybe we, we should start with Harvinder, that uh, what do you think are the essential uh, aspects that we should nurture ourselves, we should train ourselves so that we are much better equipped to work in groups and how should we uh, envision this, this concept that, yeah, we have to work with people who will not be like us. So how do we uh, navigate with that uh, idea? What's your thought? This is uh, uh, related to the question. First, the issue that has been raised, how do you interact with people of different diverse backgrounds? Mm -hmm. And this has also been mentioned in earlier that uh, we have to know about other people with different language groups, different is. One thing I would like to add is don't assume things about, let's say, a particular language group or different set of people. Ask them directly if you would like to know about more of them. It's better to ask directly. About work also, same thing goes. You ask the person directly. And in a conference or something, you uh, approach the people. If, if they are not free, you fix up a time. These kind of little, little details that can be basically learned on the job. Uh, Coming back to the question of interacting with different people, as I said, uh, researching about them already. If you're talking to a person uh, about your work and you're talking to a person who's not exactly working in the field that you're working on, know about their work beforehand talking to them. In fact, that is what makes a discussion more uh, meaningful and progressive in that sense. Mm -hmm. Some progress can be made in a fruitful discussion is what I mean. Great. Great. So uh, we... Yeah, please, please, please. This please. is one of the specific things. It's, it's just an example. So basically, uh, to know about the person you're going to interact with or a group of people, that helps already if you make do a basic research before working in a group of people. Mm -hmm. okay. Know about them already. Yeah, know but sometimes it's not possible because maybe, you know, I, I have worked with people whom I never met and we are always you know, communicating, corresponding over emails. Yeah, I, I, what I mean is generally met in the sense that you communicate over email or, or basically, I know some people I've never met, but I've worked with some people also. Yeah. This is what I mean. Meeting is not just person into yes, person. Yes, yes, yes. So that's also okay. communicating through various communication channels like emails or, in fact, some people we meet on various social media these days which we have never met in person. Yes, yes. So basically, I think knowing about the other person and doing a basic research on who we are talking to is important. Thank you so much, Harvinder. I, I guess maybe the broader idea is that we have to meet with a lot of people 
and and know people from different we have to mingle a lot of a lot with other culture people from different backgrounds to have more perspective on that yes people can be different and we cannot just assume that someone someone who came from this has to be has to know this or know that as you suggested great so maybe uh, 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 sushmita is your microphone yeah. working now yeah now it's okay yeah i think i think we can hear so do you want to share yeah. like uh, some of the experiences that you feel uh, uh, you want to tell us in the panel because we haven't heard you so far so yeah, yeah. Sorry for the problem. So, uh, yeah, uh, last time you questioned about some uh, what uh, I experienced in universities. Uh, Environment. Yeah. Because uh, your yeah. master's was at IIT, as I know you, but yeah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, first of all, uh, in, in university, uh, we are uh, working in with with very uh, some basic with some basic facilities and uh, we, we are not uh, granted with uh, others uh, like other universe institute uh, so we work with uh, very uh, there's many uh, many boundaries here uh, so uh, so here uh, we face many things but uh, we are uh, we are uh, it is hard to <laughs> here to work uh, sometimes but but it's okay but we are we can uh, we, we we are learning uh, from here many things uh, so we can accustom uh, in every situations uh, for that uh, so, absolutely so shushmita have you been to uh, some conferences and do you think that uh, going to conferences have helped you in you know developing perspectives or developing sort of skills on how to interact with other people who are working on problems similar to you or different from you have you have you have you felt that uh, do you think uh, conferences have uh, helped you or do you want to share yeah, yeah. it is very it is very good uh, for a researcher or many others who want to uh, to research uh, in future so yeah so my first of all, uh, at, at the beginning, I was uh, so feared and it is, uh, it is very hard to uh, communicate with others. And uh, till now I, can, I cannot share with uh, many things to others, uh, but, uh, but, it's, uh, but going to many conferences, uh, it's something that become familiar to mm -hmm. uh, communicate. So uh, I think, uh, but, uh, uh, in time, with time it will be familiar uh, so you uh, before you suggested something to for work something workshop to mentoring uh, yes, yes. for this but i think it's uh, it will be good if uh, some will happen something uh, wonderful so. great great thank you so much Shushmita. Uh, and we are glad that uh, your your audio issue has been uh, you know taken care of and we could hear you so then uh, as we are talking about uh, working in a group, working with people from diverse backgrounds, and also, you know, you can have different personalities also. People will not be like me. There might be conflicts and all that. So on that note, uh, I would invite uh, maybe Nisim, you want to, you want to have some uh, suggestions or some views on how, what are effective ways to work in a group or work and interact with diverse set of people? So I guess before I get into talking about working in a group, I would say that it's important to ask whether you want to work in a group. Uh, one nice thing about astronomy is that, I mean, you mentioned that are these gigantic collaborations and so on, right? But mm -hmm. I would say the, the converse is also true in astronomy. You're not required to work in large collaborations. That's so I think, it's important, I think it's important for people to realize that they have the choice and, and they should do what works for them. People are different. If some people like to work in, in groups and interact with people, other people like to work in small groups, other people like to work by themselves. So I think it's important to not feel pressure to, you know, to conform with some, you know, with a few people's view of how science should be done, but to realize there are different ways of doing science and you should pick the way that works for you and not pick a way that just because, uh, you know, somebody else has said that this is the path towards doing, there is no good, you know, single path towards doing uh, research and you should find out what works for you, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's that's absolutely true. But even, you know, even if you are working in, in small groups, I mean, suppose when we are becoming faculty members or, you know, suppose if I'm a postdoc, I'm going to 
uh, the uh, the every weekly astro ph archive discussion session right there are a lot of other people and so or we are in a committee serving or you know i, I think the point is just not about only research but generally when we how do we interact with people uh, in a group where there are people who can might not be like me i mean they so, can so there, is, so there is a difference in the, the way in which you handle different kinds of groups mm -hmm. and i think when, when it's important to realize this that that the, the way you function for example as a panel member versus in a say for example if you're in a in a faculty meeting right mm -hmm. they where you you may disagree strongly with your uh, with your co faculty members and there's a vote right and and that's it on the other hand in the paper there's no question of a vote mm -hmm. The, the, you, you sign up to some to something and there's no question of a vote you either, something could be right or wrong mm -hmm. the, the, your actions depend on the circumstances I, I don't think it is very meaningful to come up with a prescription for how one should behave in all groups the, it, it depends very much on the nature of the group i think it's important to listen to people mm -hmm. to listen to their and, to, and and be prepared to change your point of view if okay. uh, if if people can convince you of of their point of view mm -hmm. it's important to i think to try to communicate your point of view i think it's equally important to actually try to make space for other people uh, like say if you're in a group and and this happens very often uh, uh, certainly in faculty meetings and other groups as well that there, there could be people who are not being allowed to say something who you know are trying to say something and then they are being spoken over Mm -hmm. I think it's important if you notice this to speak up and, and try to make space for them to speak mm -hmm. as well. All yeah. of these contribute. These are kind of broad things, but the, the but the details of how you will go about this will be different. And the points at which you make a stand will be different. And that's often the place where things become complicated because that's where conflict comes in. Mm -hmm. So resolve it. So you, you, you may start with all kinds of good uh, intentions mm -hmm. and uh, how you handle conflict will depend on the the on the group, mm -hmm. but Can it's important to realize that. Sorry, sorry. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. So I uh, I, I think it's important to start with, and ideally the people who are, uh, say, heading the group, and if you're heading the group, that's extremely important. You need to create space for people. I think mm -hmm. yes. to and, cre and create space so that people can speak up and also make a stand so that if if there is somebody who is or some people who are not allowing others to speak up then you have to tell them clearly this is not acceptable mm -hmm. and it's not easy so yeah. and that can itself cause conflict so okay. that, that, that it, it, again you know it's very hard to be prescriptive over here i think yeah so you know we so we have heard like uh, personal experiences particularly from women faculty i can i can tell my own experiences that i've heard from my colleagues uh, mostly women colleagues that uh, you know, during faculty meetings or during some committee me member meeting, their voice is just, you know, just the women is not allowed to speak freely. I mean, there's a bunch of maybe it's, she's a minority in the in the faculty. There are maybe all are men and she finds it very difficult to put through her, for, through her voice and her voice is not heard. So I have heard stories from several colleagues that they are not being allowed to. So I think on that point, uh, Prajwal, uh, what's your take on this? That uh, how do we uh, work? I mean, the, the the issue that we are discussing. If you want to share some of your views, um, yeah. So I uh, certainly don't want to make uh, behavior uh, give behavior tips, um, and the reason is uh, not just that they are not okay, but that uh, I want to be, uh, try and be mindful at least that, you know, each of us, uh, each of us, we think that we as an, as a person are immune uh, to discrimination. We are immune to uh, talking down to others. We are respectful. We are all of these things. So we assume all these things, each of us, you know, uh, but uh, we should uh, remember that our social upbringing uh, steers us in the opposite way in all these respects. So then it brings me back to this whole idea of equality, education and teaching mutual respect and all of that. That is, uh, you know, one point. Another point is, I think that when we try and look at this question, um, it should sit on the bedrock that we are all uh, in the business of knowledge production and 
you know, that is a public good, which is humanity's heritage. So if we sort of keep that in mind, rather than the uh, sort of nitty gritties of the here and now, which could be, how do we get this paper out before our so-called competitors uh, get it out? You know, because that I think muddies the waters a lot and that changes the dynamics in of uh, the group. Of course, this is not up to the younger people again, it's up to group leaders and uh, PIs and so on to set the climate. Um, but I think uh, that would be an important thing. So where it becomes relevant for young people, I think, is in choosing what group you work with or what institution to work with. So I would say it is important to choose groups and institutions which have more nurturing, less competitive and more collaborative climate, which is not something you get on the web page, uh, which is something that you only get by digging deeper, talking to people who have been already there and, uh, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, and the other thing, which again connects to the whole issue of equality um, education is the idea of uh, sort of bystander, uh, bystander training, because a lot of this bad behavior or talking down to, or making the climate not nice and toxic happens because a few people who do it get away with it, uh, despite the fact that a lot of people around them don't like it. There's a lot of people who cringe at what is happening, but don't have the skills uh, perhaps or, or whatever, I don't know what to call it, to speak up and say, no, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even though you're not, the, so it, it shouldn't, again, it shouldn't be uh, up to the, 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 the woman you spoke about who gets talked down to or, um, you know, maybe uh, somebody from a religious minority who gets mocked at or uh, a person who is getting oppressed by hegemony of English, it shouldn't be up to them uh, to, you know, do the protesting or, you know, some people advise, right, you know, grit yourself, you know, be strong, etc. cetera, uh, which is correct, not that that's wrong, but I think the onus is not on them. Uh, and if there is, uh, I mean, since you brought up the women thing, I just want to say uh, that if there is only one piece of advice that I give differently depending on the gender of the person. So I tell all young women who are trying to get into academia, uh, never ever uh, make cookies and bring to work or offer to make the coffee, ever. And if somebody suggests that you do it, you just respond saying, why don't you do it, please? So. Okay. so thanks. Thanks a lot, Prajwal. So maybe this is just a quick question for all the panelists and maybe the answer will be uh, short from all of you. So we, I was being taught when, when I used to take all these you know, uh, workshop sessions or online training programs that whenever you see something, maybe it could be uh, sexual harassment or it could be some inappropriate uh, unconstitutional word that came up in an email or anything that you find is uh, you are uncomfortable with or you don't like, you have to point it out. So the institutions were asking, we have to train and make this make, we have to learn that, no, you have to always point out if you, if you don't find something uh, appropriate, you must point it out. But I have seen that uh, in our community, it's quite rare because as you said, that the bystanders that come because people are scared and afraid that, oh, if I do, I'll be victimized. I will be, you know, somebody, I will, somebody will look at me. This, this, this climate of fear prevents people from doing the right thing. So what would be your advice? Because we have so many young people in the panel. So what would be your one-liner? I mean, you, you spoke about never bring cookies and coffee to the young woman to your workplace. But if you see things that are, I think Nisim also pointed out that in a faculty meeting, when you see that someone is trying to, uh, you know, put down someone else, just say that, no, let them speak. So, and the bystander approach. So what would you advise our young colleagues that what should be their approach? Should they be uh, very proactive? I'm sure they should be, but please, if, if, if you can just tell us a couple of lines about what should be their stand on these issues, that would be helpful. So uh, maybe Prajwal, Harvinder, and then Nisim. Let's reverse the order because I just okay. Oh. Okay, very good. So Harvinder, uh, so Nisim, Harvinder, Prajwal, Nisim, please quickly. 
No, let me defer to Harvinder. Uh, okay, Harvinder, please. Yeah. I, I can go after Harvinder and then Prajwal. Sure, sure, sure. Harvinder, please. Uh, Maybe I missed out on something, but uh, could you please think, just specifically? Yeah, uh, the point say, is that what would you advise that if you see something wrong is happening, what would you advise our younger colleagues that they should officially report it or raise their voice, protest it, or because you know the bystander that problem is a big problem in academia. Most people don't like bad behavior, but they just don't have, they always feel that I'll get victimized. I'll be the one person if I speak up, others will keep quiet and I'll get victimized. And a lot of wrongdoings keep happening because of this you know, approach, because people fear, not just young people, even senior people I have seen, they say, oh, you know, if I do, I have to take all this ordeal. And the things go for generations, the same problems keep propagating. So what would be your advice so, on that? Uh, the fear is not unjustified. That is true. Another thing, but if you think you are right and there is a conflict, you basically just say your point, repeat it in the sense that reiterate it once, twice. You have to basically stand your ground. And that's the only advice I can give in this. Wonderful. You have to stand your ground if you are confident that what you are saying is absolutely right. So you should believe in yourself and put stand your ground. Thank you, Harvinder Nisim. Okay, so I would go about it in a slightly nuanced way. So the, 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 the way I would start is that the problem does not start with an incident. It starts with when you join a place. So the, 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 you need, you need the, 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 uh, the background in the institution, the confidence in the institution. So the, the, the approach which I would suggest is to, is, to, is to start by looking for groups around you looking for people around you who have similar perspectives mm -hmm. and to also try to bring people together. So for example, like say in this thing, right? There are two things that are important. One is the victim, the person who's actually had the, so the, supporting the person who has had the, 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 the direct experience is one. The second thing is, what do you do about it? What do you do about it in the sense of, because these are not necessarily the same thing. In, in, in the sense that the, the providing support to somebody versus taking up the matter and getting a, a retribution yeah. are, not, are, are not on the same page. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the approach you, you, that you might take in the two might be different. Mm -hmm. for, for example, uh, 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 reporting a problem, the, the person who has to do the reporting is often the person who has had the problem. Yeah, the victim. Right? So it's not exactly the same thing to say that, okay, I've seen something. Now I'm going to report it and take the matter forward. You, you may not be allowed to report it. I mean, in the sense that if, if the and, and this has actually happened in NCRA uh, directly, that uh, you that if you report something and if the person who has had the issue doesn't want to well, go forward, yeah, it can right. be conflicted. Yes, yes. So, so, the, so the central balance probably needs to come in. So I think one uh, being there for the victim for, for the person who is who is in the center is important. Beforehand. Uh, uh, having a feeling for which people in the institution will be willing to support such a thing is important. Mm -hmm. Having a support group is important, you know, both for you and for other people. Mm -hmm. So, so I think all of uh, all of these probably will influence your uh, or could influence your your behavior. My general thing is that these things are not easy in the sense that it, it's very easy to tell somebody that look, you should behave like this. And that's not easy because you know, your, your your own complexities will come into the matter, uh, 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 how you handle difficulties and, and that, that can cause immense strain on you. So yes, I think it's important to say that one should support people in a difficult situation. It's really important. But now, something that was mentioned a little while ago, I think Prajwal mentioned it, that the idea that, that a person who uh, is herself uh, or himself in, in some situations, part of a group which has been discriminated against. Now people saying that, okay, look, you know, you didn't support this other person when he or she was in that situation. This is not good. I, I think that's also unhealthy. So I think it's important to look for the strength to support uh, each other in, the, in these things. Try to find the strength and try to find that strength by working together, by looking for people who will also support you in your, in your attempt to support people. Okay. It, it's not easy. I mean, I, uh, yes, I think. absolutely, it's not easy. Thank you, Nisim. So, uh, Prajwal, maybe then you're before we move on to the our younger people. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so uh, I would just add uh, to whatever Harvinder and uh, Nisim have said. I think Harvinder's, uh, I, I think the two are at two different sort of scale levels. And I would go one level further. Uh, uh, so it is more difficult to implement, but I think uh, that is, uh, that should be done, which is choice. I mentioned this earlier also, choice of the institution you work with, of the group you might work with. And uh, for younger people, I, as I said, uh, you won't get the answers on the web page for sure. So you will get it by talking to people who've been there. You might get it from other pointers such as, uh, for example, what is the gender ratio of faculty in that institution or in that group? Um, what is the, your sense of the stratification? And I also tell people that you know when they are uh, looking for groups, uh, they should also ask questions like how much autonomy will they get as, as earlier, early career members in a certain institution or in a certain group, how much autonomy will they get? Because today, you know, uh, when you're a postdoc, especially in the West, you uh, have, you get research grants, you have full autonomy to take decisions on spending yeah. those grants. You run meetings as part of large collaborations. Typically, postdocs run meetings, which might include, you know, Nobel Prize winners to uh, PhD students, and they manage these meetings. There's all these kind of experiences that postdocs who've gone abroad come with, and uh, so it is important for them to ask these questions of the institutions in India. Will they have that kind of autonomy in the institutions in India? Will they be able to take PhD students? Will they be able to take internship students? If so, so how many will some um, you know a boss have to sign off on uh, spending uh, requisitions and if so you know what and how so these kind of questions uh, people I think do need to ask I think younger people today tend to look at institutions by some kind of overall ranking of prestige and um, maybe individual researchers and how many nature papers they publish or something like that. But I think those things don't tell the whole story. So that is what I would say. Thank you so much, Prajwal. So we have already spoken for one and a half hours. Now I would invite uh, our uh, other panelists, the, the postdocs and the students to any of them can volunteer if they want to bring something uh, about this aspect, like, you know, speaking up or, you know, uh, protesting some bad behavior on this aspect or any other aspect that they think is relevant to the discussion. So any of you can volunteer uh, uh, to bring up some issues. Uh, please unmute yourself and speak, uh, any of you, any volunteers who want to add to this discussion. I think Mopia has raised her hand. Yeah, please Mopia, please, please unmute yourself. Oh. Hi, uh, so I have uh, two things to share here. So first thing is uh, now we are talking about the bystander effect. I think uh, uh, it would be good to have one or two ombuds people mm -hmm. who are faculties maybe where you can go and uh, just talk to them that this has happened mm -hmm. or I have seen that this has happened. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't necessarily need to be very formal, but you know that there would be person where you, who you can openly speak to and they would be friendly. And then since they're a bit more senior people, they can advise you uh, how to go about it. Do you go to the dean or department head or go to the police or what is the next step should be? Uh, so that can be a like guideline or a guide person. This can help, I think, a lot of people because uh, a lot of young people, they don't know what to do. Uh, if this has happened and like they say that there is a justified fear that I'm a PhD student and uh, say something happened inside the group if I report it then my PhD would be jeopardized which uh, is not unheard of yeah so I mean there should be a safe outlet but it needs to be done by the institute itself absolutely and uh, yeah it needs to come from the top absolutely and uh, one other thing uh, that we were discussing before that how to uh, engage in a good discussion with a diverse group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to know about uh, your privileges as well as your dis disadvantages. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, I see that there are many times there are discussions uh, about women in science and that there are certain things that uh, we are disadvantaged uh, group but there are many access of privilege 
And there are other axes where we might be quite uh, privileged uh, with respect to a lot of the population of India. Say like, you, I mean, your mental health, if you are mentally healthy, if you are uh, fully abled, you are not disabled, uh, you have uh, like, you have your parents and your home life is secured. That's one access of privilege. And like you are, you are like moderately wealthy and you are like, um, it, you, you are not on the LGBT spectrum. These are all like privileged spectrum of things. So I think these things need to be discussed and people need to be aware of it so that they know that what, there may be many invisible things that your colleague or your friend has to deal with. It may not always be very black and white. Uh, so if, you are, if we are aware of this, it would be much more easy to empathize with a very diverse group of people if and when you come into contact with them. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely fantastic, Nopia. That's a great, great suggestion. And also, as you put in a very positive note that we should both, we should, we should, we should equally be thinking about our privileges and our, you know, uh, and our under, and, and our lack of privileges, because in both ways, we can create perspective and that can heavily affect how we interact with people. As you said, that my colleague can have some invisible problem. They might be having a special child at home and that can that can be a difficult situation for them. So these concerns are very important uh, when we are interacting with people. Thank you so much, Mopia. So anybody uh, else? Yes, yes. Can I say something quickly? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, just to respond to Mopia's first point, it's, it's a very, very good point and uh, it's not unheard of. So my impression is that LIGO India already has such a position and the Raman Institute actually has such a position. Actually, I'm that person. So it's not such an unheard of uh, thing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we're very glad to uh, hear that you are that ombudsperson. And so I hope that uh, as we are discussing that institutions should have the onus and they should be very proactive in making practices mainstream so that, I mean, it should not be the onus on the people who are part of the community. It's really our institutions and senior people who should be very proactive in having practices so that people don't feel discouraged to report a problem and they don't feel that there is a environment of fear as our environment of fear or environment of toxicity, toxicity, et cetera. So anybody else? I think uh, somebody raised hand. Nisim, did you raise your hand or? Yeah, I, I actually wanted to, again, uh, yeah, I think Mopia's point is a very good one, the first one, especially that uh, it's important to have some kind of an ombudsperson. And I'm very happy to hear the Prachwal is the ombudsperson for, uh, for RRI. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, the, 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 the complication there is the usual one. So for, for example, the standard response that institutions will give you is that there's an internal complaints committee mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, the head of the committee is then the, the person who should be contacted. Uh, the, the thing that we have seen in NCRA certainly and in TIFR in general, uh, uh, in, in fact, this came up in the TIFR ethics group that uh, that it, it's often hard to get in touch because there are there are hierarchies within institutions for a person who is a, a, a PhD student, for example, even to get in touch with the ombudsperson who might be a colleague of the suppose you want to complain about a faculty member, the, the ombudsperson may be a colleague of the of the faculty member, at which point that can get complicated. So it's it's good to have an external ombudsperson, I think, who is uh, who is less connected to the institution. Uh, how one sets this up is 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 not easy. So we, we, we've been talking at TIFR about doing a pan TIFR student support, student and postdoc support cell, where which has so people can get in touch with people from outside your own institute, and you know who bring in a completely external point of view. Even that is not. I, I mean, uh, you can see. Uh, difficulties, but at least that might help. So, but but having an external person, I think, is uh, you know might help. I don't know. Yeah. So that you are saying that that reduces the conflict of interest angle and all that. Yeah. yeah. And people the are thing more that I sort of the act thing I've heard, more neutrally. Yeah. The thing I've heard from students uh, with this regard is that the, 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 that that safe space that you can actually go and speak to the ombudsperson with the confidence that this information will not be revealed you know, to other people is, is really important. Yes. In fact, in, in, in places in universities in the US where, where there is this notion of the ombudsperson, there have been cases, fairly well-known cases in the last 10, 15 years 
where the ombudsperson has actually behaved inappropriately. And mm -hmm. that has caused even worse problems. So, you know, the an, ombuds, an, ombuds, an ombudsperson is important, but the behavior of the ombudsperson is actually very important in this. But it would be illegal, wouldn't it, if it would like to disseminate a private information? I mean, if you are in an official position, I mean, for yes. example, if I'm the ICC chair and I discuss things, that then I will be penalized, right? So the the you, 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 so what you're doing now is getting to the thing of punishment or retribution, right? Th that gets into the issue of proof. So all of these become very complicated. Yeah. For example, if it's a private if it's a private conversation, and the ombudsperson, yeah. even with good intentions, tries to handle it privately by providing information to somebody privately, this gets very very messy. Absolutely. So. Yeah, uh, if I, I would just comment. So in, in our grad school, we had two ombudspersons. One was a female faculty, one was a male faculty, and uh, one was very, a very junior faculty and the other one was very senior faculty. And I think it's very important to establish that person as a very friendly face so that the first thing is that we the young students should not be afraid to go to them. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, that... Um, even among faculties, there are some people that you a lot of people feel very comfortable with, and other people they might be a bit shy to go to. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe this idea that maybe we have two ombudsperson, one from the institute and one from outside of the institute, that may be uh, covering yeah. the whole thing. Because you are saying that you know sometimes speaking about private thing could be very difficult if this is an external person you don't. Yeah, if I don't know that person at all, it maybe be easier even... if you are talking to somebody who is very friendly and you have interacted with previously. Yeah, yeah. so that's a very good suggestion that have two people. Wonderful. Anybody else uh, among the younger panelists who wish to uh, share some views on this? Uh, Ovik or... Uh, Sudeshna, anybody else? Please raise your hand if you have anything to share in this panel, because we are at the very end of the discussion session. And so I don't see uh, any hands here. Maybe then uh, we, I, I see that there are uh, several people uh, who are participating as audience. So maybe we can take one or two audience question before we uh, end the session. So any, is there any question from the audience? Is there any question from the audience? Then you can please raise your hand. So Chitana, I... what about the YouTube thing? So the YouTube we did not, right? It was not live streamed. So nobody is watching on YouTube. So everybody either is in the Zoom or we'll have to put it in YouTube later. Uh, so I don't see hands raised among the audience. Uh, in that case, uh, I will just go to the uh, mentors that, uh, at a final note, is there some specific things you wish to on based on the discussions we have or some on some other matters that you feel is extremely important that you want to communicate to your um, younger colleagues? Uh, would you please uh, uh, take it take some, take some time to uh, you know share this with us? Harvinder, is there anything any final words for the panel and for the audience and everyone in general? So, so what my take from the meeting is that. Uh, one is that there should be workshops in developing skills and also basically evaluate ourselves. And uh, another is to talk to people you are comfortable with in the sense that you basically take a mic. So uh, one thing is it can be in your institute, it can be in other institutes. So we can have a network of people who are people are comfortable with and talk to each other about their problems. And basically probably we have similar share stories to share. Mm -hmm. And that is something which will come with time, I think, because people do will, will take time to uh, understand a person and see whether they have a safe space to talk about that or not. So that's my take that, okay, people want to talk, please do talk about this problem. And in the case of conflict, as Nisim and I had two uh, diverse point of view in this sense, but they are actually in the related in the sense that sometimes you have to say what you have to say, and it is difficult. So you look for people who can be your support uh in that maybe they have the same story thanks okay. thank you so much harvinder uh, prajbal any final note uh yes yeah, so I, I think for a final note i would say that uh academia and uh 
astrophysics in particular can be a very, very exciting place to be. However, if there are negative experiences, it is important, I think, to remember that it's not about you. Uh, it's not about the person who is uh, experiencing the negative thing. It's not even about uh, a couple of bad apples who are perpetuating because we are all, regardless of how well-meaning we are, we are all complicit uh, in this whole thing of negative climate, which is a structural problem. So when people look for solutions, when people suggest, uh, you know, why don't you do this? or why don't you do that to uh, mitigate the problem uh, that is uh, sort of barking up the wrong tree? And we really need to address it institutionally. Okay. Thank you so much, Rajwal. And Nisim? Actually, Arunima has a hand up for a while. Yeah, sure. Please, Arunima. Sorry about that. No, I think, Nisim, you can go ahead. I have a question from a completely different perspective. So maybe you can. Go ahead, and after that, I'll ask. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not very good at giving advice uh, on... Uh, um, probably, the, the, I guess the, the one thing that, that I would suggest is that... Uh, okay, I, I, should, I should put in a caveat that I, I don't think Harvinder and I are very far from each other on this. Yes. <laughs> on, the, on that issue about how to address conflict. It's more about, it's more about detail. I agree it's important to stand your ground, but it, it's also probably important to give yourself the space to realize it's difficult to stand your, stand your ground. <laughs> so I, I don't think we are very far away from each other. Uh, uh, on general things, I would say that uh, one thing that has uh, you know bothered me is that I feel that people sometimes judge themselves too harshly, uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, evaluating yourself. And it's very hard to evaluate yourself. Uh, Especially in things like uh, like research or work and so on, right? That are you doing uh, and that are you doing well? Are you doing badly? So I think it's important, at least for me, to 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 uh, to not to to realize that you cannot be objective about evaluating yourself, and so don't do it. Try to to try to to uh, in terms of work at least, try to be uh, less harsh about you know to yourself. Uh, and try to be less harsh towards other people in terms of your evaluation uh, of them. If you're giving people advice, uh, it, it would be it's useful to give people reasons for the advice um, as opposed to the advice itself. And then let them uh, decide. Very often solutions that work for me may not work for somebody else. And solutions that work for somebody else may not work for me. So, um, um, and, and I, I think it's important to have groups to, to identify people who you can talk to. And that's, I think that's true for all of us. And that's about all I have. Great. Uh, Arunima, please, uh, do you want to say yeah, something? Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, after uh, attending all these sessions, WGG sessions and similar sessions in ISER, some of our students wanted to work for WGG in their own capacity. Sorry, my office is little. <laughs> so do you have any uh, advice for them? Like some of the students approached me and they said, yeah, after attending this session, so I, can, I can feel that we have all gone through this, but somehow we have ignored them. But I think it's high time we all should come together. And even in our capacity, uh, we can work for WGG, for example. So what, what advice would you give for them? I think this yeah, is a very, very... Yeah, do you, do you have somebody specifically you want to address this question to or? I think Prajwal raised her hand. Oh, please Prajwal. So uh, I'm no longer in the WGGE, but when I was, we had discussed the idea of creating a mailing list of people uh, in the ASI or not necessarily official members of the ASI, but in the astrophysics community who resonate with the idea of the WGG. And uh, so then, you know, it would be a mailing list of people to whom we would send updates and who people who uh, could offer uh, to uh, offer ideas and also who we would call upon, uh, we meaning the WGG would call upon uh, to volunteer for some specific activities, either during the SI or 
outside of it. So I have uh, reminded some of the working group members about this idea and uh, we were gonna call them associates or something like that. I don't remember, it doesn't matter. The name doesn't matter. So something like this was already discussed. So I will certainly remind uh, the WGG members. I think Suchetana, you are on the WGG, right? Yes, right I'm on the WGG. And I okay, okay so there you go. Yes. There you go. So uh, the idea is that, you know, it's a larger group because a working group can only have a limited number of people, but this would be a larger group, which would be a pool of people who resonate with the issue and who could volunteer, who could discuss. It could be a forum once in a while to just brainstorm that sort of thing. Okay. Thank you so much, Prajwal. So on that note, I think uh, we'll end the session. And I'd, I'd like to thank all the panelists who spoke today in the meeting. And I'm sure that, uh, I hope that it was useful to everybody. And I will just end the session with the last note, actually resonating almost what Prajwal said, that astronomy, physics uh, is a very, very exciting field. And we have our capacity to contribute there in our own ways. And all of us are very special. We contribute, especially my contribution can be different. Your contribution can be different from other and nobody should undermine it because we need this diverse contribution for our field to mature and grow. And there can be points, all of us, all of us go through points in our career, in our life, even if we become senior professors, I'm sure is the same thing, which are frustrating, which will be issues where we feel that there is a problem that I cannot overcome. There is a hurdle that's always, you know, I'm harsh on it. I'm not being able to cross through the barrier. But I think from today's discussion, I'm sure you will be convinced. And let me tell you, you should be convinced that problems will be there. There are solutions. Talk to people, talk to your professors, your peer groups, your mentors, and keep networking and discuss your issues. And you will see that the problems are nothing related to you. They are very, sometimes very generic problem. And, and be, be positive uh, and you know, enrich our field. And let's enrich our field as we go ahead. So on that note, uh, I, will, I will stop. And thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. OK, bye. So maybe once more, everybody in the video, if possible. You should take a picture uh, or whatever it's called. Somebody take a picture in shot. Uh, in shot, right? I'm so low, you know, I don't have, I'm text, not so text. I will do, I will do it. You'll do it. Thank you, Arunuma. Yeah. But the others should come on. Uh, yeah, come don't on. go away. I'll say, <laughs> I'll tell you. And also thanks to the audience uh, who were there uh, hearing us for two years. I hope that you have gotten something from the discussion today. So we'll uh, they could also they could also put their videos on. Yeah, that's possible. Can the audience who are there in the panel in the discussion panel switch on their videos, please? If they like. Yeah, if they want. Yeah. So maybe I'll just have the grid view or whatever view it's called gallery view. Yeah. Two more, Nilanjana, please. <laughs> Nilanjana, are you there? Yeah, I have taken one more with the others. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah, bye. bye Thank everybody. you. So I'm just ending the meeting, okay? Thank you. And I will send the recording, yeah.